Hey, good day, everybody. Today is day two of the U.S. Biochar Initiative Biochar Funding Opportunity utilizing the USDA and RCS Code 336 and 808 Soil Carbon Amendments. So, got a great uh, great event for you today. Uh, lots of uh, interesting panelists. We're going to have take a little bit of a different approach today. The communications went so well yesterday with our Q&A sessions. Uh, we're going to be a little more conversational today. Go ahead and take some deep dives to answer your questions. I do want to remind you that this is being recorded and will be published to a streaming service uh, within the next one to two weeks. Uh, when that is, we will notify you via email. So for anybody that registered, um, I do want to let you know that uh, this does qualify for CEUs for the certified crop uh, consultants. So email me after the event and I'll uh, submit the paperwork for your credits. So thank you for attending everybody. Quick notice about the U.S. Biochar Initiative. We are a not-for-profit organization, and we promote the sustainable production and use of biochar through research policy and implementation. We work with a lot of biochar producers. We work with a lot of agronomists. Uh, we work with closely with uh, industries and associations. Uh, we do consulting with NRCS and a number of other federal agencies, uh, forestry partners. We have a close relationship with the U.S. Forest Service. We do equipment development. We do a wide range of things. Uh, we are volunteer based, so uh, we do count on your donations to, to help us uh, move things forward. Uh, we will be at the compost conference next week. So if anybody is going to the 2023 compost conference, be sure to stop by our booth and say hello, talk to us. So, and again, any biochar producers that are out there, I'm gonna remind you that we do have that active directory on our website and to uh, sign up for that. As well, USBI has an excellent newsletter that we produce monthly, so uh, please do go to our site and sign up. My name is John. I'm the Director of Communications for the US Biochar Initiative. I uh, have been a biochar producer for a little over three years now. I have a commercial pyrolyzer here in Salt Lake City. Uh, so I'm familiar with the field from a couple of different angles, and uh, I tell you, there's never been a better time to be in the biochar uh, business and there's never been a better time to build soil health. So day two program panelists, uh, we're, uh, we've got the biochar atlas with Kristen Tripp. We do have uh, Pacific biochar with Josiah Hunt and uh, Charles McIntosh. Hey Josiah. And then we have the USBI board of director, Tom Miles, the man, the myth, the legend, and he will be talking about safety today. So uh, then we're going to have a presentation from uh, Phil Blum, and uh, the Web Soil Survey, which is also a fantastic tool. And that conversation with Richard Reed is also going to be, is going to be wrapped in with Kristen's presentation. So uh, we do need to give a big shout out and thank you uh, and to let everybody know we really appreciate our financial sponsors today. Uh, that's what makes programs like this available. So we have the Composting U.S. Composting Council, American Farmland Trust, Grain Ecosystems, Bow ASA, Wakefield Biochar, uh, Go Biochar, and then a, a tremendous uh, amount of thanks has to go out to the U.S. Forest Service uh, for significant amount of funding for this event, uh, and a fantastic partner for U.S. Biochar Initiative. So our schedule on day two, again, this is about a three, uh, three hour and 15 minute session. We will have a break in the middle. We're gonna start out with this intro and we're gonna be moving on to Kristen's presentation on the Biochar Atlas. She will show us about how, uh, how to utilize the tool and what it means and how to uh, understand Biochar lab reports. It's gonna be very interesting. Uh, she's gonna be paired with Richard Reed, who's going to be giving an overview of his web soil survey tool. And then Josiah Hunt's gonna be uh, talking about a new project that we have going on for the US Biochar Initiative to help uh, help folks understand their biochar journey and utilization uh, in soil. That's when we're gonna take our short break. Uh, and then Josiah and Charlie from Pacific Biochar will be back on. They'll, they're gonna talk about their experience working with uh, producers who are installing soil, uh, soil biochar and working with codes 336 and 808. After that, we'll be speaking with Phil from TerraChar. He's gonna be uh, talking about biochar practices on farm. Uh, this is gonna cover things like uh, utilization with poultry, some composting uh, and, and other items. So it's uh, real practical, uh, down to earth, fantastic information. Then Tom Miles 
We'll be kind of closing us up with a uh, discussion on shipping storage and safety and the practical practices that you need to be aware of when you're uh, working with biochar. We'll have a very brief closing set of closing remarks. And then uh, one of the best parts of this, that we're gonna have an extended Q&A that will go until 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, yesterday, we had so many fantastic questions. This was packed until the very last moment. So uh, anyone that we didn't get to your questions yesterday, uh, we are sorry about that. We're working on follow-up responses. Again, I would wanna give you a reminder that we will be um, publishing this video um, and we'll let you know when it's there. We will also provide supporting documentation uh, and we're working with everybody to get the slide decks released. So that way we can uh, put those up on the USBI website. So, uh, and those will all be uh, provided to you in an email as follow-up. So with that, we're about to start session one and, and I want to introduce you to Kristen Tripp. So Kristen, if you can start your video and come on in. Kristen is heads up the Biochar Atlas. Uh, the Pacific Nor Northwest Biochar Atlas Project, and she is a, as you can see, she's a research microbiologist, <laughs> and uh, we're really looking forward to today's session. So, Kristen, I'm going to uh, go, you should be able to go ahead and start sharing your screen. Hey. Um, you see my main screen? Yes, we do. Sweet. Okay. So, uh, good morning, afternoon, uh, morning from the West Coast. What... Um, I want to do is quick introduce myself. My name is Kristen Tripp. I'm a research microbiologist at the USDA Forage Seed and Cereal Research Unit here in Corvallis, Oregon. And before I start, I just want to thank a few people. I want to thank John uh, for inviting me and for organizing the meeting and accommodating all the last minute changes we've had over the last month. So um, thanks for all your hard work. Uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsors. We couldn't be there, uh, be here without them. Um, and I, I'd like to thank you for spending your morning or your afternoon uh, with me. I appreciate it. And I hope that the work I'm about to show you can help you make decisions about uh, biochar. I've been working in biochar for about uh, a decade, and our efforts have been focused on trying to understand how to better pair biochar with specific soil deficiencies. Over uh, the last two years, biochar is finally being recognized uh, by the government as a climate smart ag practice. So I'm excited to work across agencies uh, to collaborate on expanding uh, the use of biochar in, in ag, um, and whether that's forestry or field crops or even uh, other sectors. Um, I really like uh, 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 working with folks to how to find the right biochar uh, for the right application. So I'm excited to be here to share this work with you, uh, to hear feedback um, about our efforts uh, to make biochar more accessible and more effective um, for end users. Um, but I also want to recognize some of the people who did the work that I'm going to show you today. Uh, Claire Phillips was a postdoc in my lab. She did a lot of work on the back end of this when uh, she was a postdoc. Now she's at the USDA in Pullman, Washington. Um, I'd also uh, like to uh, recognize Adam Lindsay, Lindsley, who did a lot of the work designing the map interface. Um, he's now an assistant professor in data sciences at Oregon State. Um, and the work was funded uh, by the USDA Climate Hub um, and the USGS Climate Adaptation Centers. NRCS has uh, started an agreement with us called the National uh, Biochar Agreement. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of my presentation. So just a, a quick outline. Oh, hang on, my slide's not advancing. There we go. So just a quick uh, roadmap of today's talk. I'll give a brief introduction, um, talk about some of the existing tools uh, that we have that you can use to inform biochar-based decisions, including uh, the NRCS uh, practice. And then I'll move into interpreting biochar reports to answer questions like, how much carbon am I adding to the soil? And then talk about some bio, uh, some common biochar conversions. Josiah is going to follow up with that and show you some calculators you can use as well. Um, and then we'll move into some brief economics, talk about expansion of the current tools in partnership with the NRCS and other folks. And then uh, if there's a little bit more time, um, I'm hoping you can provide me some feedback um, and ideas about how to make this tool more useful uh, for you. So just some brief introductory slides. Um, I'm going to assume that most people know what biochar is, um, but just so we're all on the same page. Uh, I know there's some folks out there who haven't used it before. So, so what is it? Well, the most um, easy definition is that 
uh, it's biochar is charcoal that's added to the soil. And usually we use this in the context of agriculture and environmental remediation. Um, given that definition, biochar is really different from fly ash or paper mill waste because the key to biochar is that it's produced in the absence of oxygen, which means that unlike some of those more ashier products, um, it's not completely combusted, which leaves these dense carbon structures uh, that you can see up here. Um, and these dense carbon structures can be quite functional in the soil. Um, the other thing that I'd like to note is that unlike ash, biochar retains the framework of the parent material. So here you can see uh, in this micrograph of a conifer biochar, you can see it retains the cellular structure of, of the wood. And just to um, sort of um, uh, contrast that, here's some straw uh, biochar, and you can appreciate just how different uh, that is on the molecular level. So we've all heard that biochar fills the needs of agriculture in several ways. To just talk about a few examples, in the Pacific Northwest, there's just a desperate need to create markets for low value wood uh, biomass uh, to spur the implementation of silviculture treatments that reduce wildfire risk. Uh, studies have shown that pr the production of biochar from low value wood sequesters carbon uh, compared to pile and burn and other business as usual scenarios, and that the utilization of biochar increases soil health and crop yields um, generally. In other regions of the country, biochar can be, be produced uh, from things like poultry litter um, or manure, diverting those raw materials away from soils where they can cause nutrient leaching into waterways. Um, the biochar produced from poultry litter can be applied to soils, or it can be reapplied to poultry houses where it can reduce ammonia or improve animal health. Um, it can be used as a compost additive, it can be a sustainable replacement for other soil amendments, it can absorb toxins. Um, but these sort of stories of um, sustainable synergies is what draws so many of us into biochar research. And as John mentioned yesterday, there's no lack of research on biochar. Um, this is a recent web of, so uh, web of science search. And you can see that there's over 25,000 publications since 2009. Um, I looked yesterday and there's 174 meta-analyses on biochar. Um, but despite this sort of vast knowledge base, biochar agronomic practices aren't being widely adopted. And to be quite frank, I don't think this is super surprising. Um, with any new discovery, there's what they call a technology curve or a hype cycle that describes how adoption of that technology happens. Um, and just to think about this for a minute, you know, when a new technology emerges, there's a lot of enthusiasm and hope that that technology will revolutionize an industry. And this is called the peak of inflated expectations. However, as barriers um, to uh, 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 um, uh, however, as barriers to the adoption are experienced, this peak is quickly followed by the trough of disillusionment, which sounds really awful, but it just reflects that the technology isn't as straightforward as we thought. However, as that technology is improved and the barriers start to be lowered, um, as we learn more, we move through the slope of enlightenment until that technology is ultimately adopted. Um, with biochar, I would say that right now we're in that slope of enlightenment. Um, and uh, so that's a really exciting time. But to move towards this plateau of productivity, I'd like to offer that, that the barriers to adoption uh, need to be addressed. And those barriers are lack of grower guidelines, standards, and best management practices, and the ability to predict um, outcome and cost benefit. And so today, I'm going to tell you about a decision support toolkit that we built to lower some of these barriers. So as I said, uh, there's 25,000 research articles on biochar. And uh, those research articles, uh, some of them address what biochar can and cannot do in soils. Um, and so uh, you can see looking at this meta-analysis that was done in 2012, biochar may or may not do lots of things. So just for those who aren't familiar with response ratios, if you know, you're looking at a response ratio that's on this side of the graph, it's generally not responsive. If you're looking at one over here, it is. So if we look at, you know, um, above and below ground biomass improvement, you can see that, you know, generally biochar additions do help that. Um, they also, uh, but they may probably reduce tissue uh, nitrogen concentration. They probably don't have a, a huge effect on so soil and organic nitrogen. 
um, they uh, change pH. Um, but what you can see is that we know for sure that biochar sequesters carbon, and that's shown here, um, in, in that almost every study where biochar is added to the soil, that we have a, a boost in carbon. Um, so we also know that biochar can do things like reduce acidity, retain nutrients, um, increase microbial biomass, and we know that it improves yields sometimes. Um, but that yield improvement generally happens when we match the right biochar with the right soil deficiency. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So one of the main barriers to the adoption of biochar-based technologies um, is the very thing that makes biochar so cool to begin with, um, that they're tunable, that they are diverse, um, and that their physiochemical properties are different based on um, what just happened here, um, their physical uh, chemical properties are different depending on what they're produced from and how they're produced. So here we've got a biochar that's made from three different feedstocks, hazelnut shells, um, invasive juniper, and poultry litter. And you can see just by looking at these biochars that they're really different on the macro scale, but they're also really different on the molecular level. So let's take a look at that. If we just compare um, the poultry litter and the hazelnut um, and look at the type and amount of carbon in those biochars, you can see that the hazelnut um, has a lot more stable carbon um, than the poultry litter. Um, but, uh, and the, uh, sorry, um, and much less ash, um, which lowers its fertilizer value. But it gets even more complicated than that. So as we increase the production temperature here, we more than double it. You can see that the um, volatile carbon in the poultry litter turns to ash, whereas the volatile carbon in the hazelnut biochar tends to turn to stable carbon. So you can see that the production and the feedstock conditions have a profound impact on the molecular properties of a char. And that in turn significantly impacts the way that the char interacts with the soil and the plant to provide fertilizer value, um, which is shown in this top graph, and um, liming value, which is shown on the bottom. But it also affects a whole host of other properties, including hydrophobicity, water holding capacity, particle size, and microbial impact. Um, so the point of the slide is to just say that just looking at a biochar without knowing anything about it, it's gonna be difficult to predict how that biochar will interact with soil and plants. So the question is, can we match biochars with soil and crop needs? So when I get calls from uh, farmers asking me how they can implement biochar practices, I don't really have a right answer to give them because biochar can't be applied as a one size fits all solution. Biochars vary in their physiochemical properties and the types of benefits they can offer and soils vary in their deficiencies. So to answer sort of this fundamental question of what kind of biochar to use and how much to use is consistently, well, what are you trying to accomplish? What's the limiting factor in your cropping system that you're hoping to ameliorate with biochar? And how much of biochar do you need to accomplish that? And so uh, if this sounds uh, familiar, um, if this sounds familiar, uh, it might sound a lot like um, nutrient management, right? So to skip to the punchline, in order to get the most benefit from your biochar or for any soil amendment for that matter, you have to identify cropping goals, um, identify products that can address those goals and then use those products at a, a rate that makes sense. And of course, like I said, this sounds a lot like the four R's using the right rate, the right place, the right source and the right time. Um, these principles are really important for correctly ut use, utilizing fertilizer, but using biochar to improve soil health and crop yields require similar thought. Um, now, I think Richard's going to jump in and talk about um, and talk about choosing the right place. Hey, everybody, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Great, that's awesome. So, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, as Kristen mentioned. Uh, on the biochar atlas. Um, I was sort of added to this agenda kind of last minute, but it, but this presentation on the web soil survey interpretation dovetails very well with the biochar atlas. And so I think, um, I think it adds value to the webinar. So uh, like I said, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I would be remiss uh, not to give full credit 
uh, to a co-author of this presentation uh, and, and really the mastermind behind the web soil survey interpretation we're exploring today. Um, Bob Dobos is a soil scientist with USDA NRCS uh, Soil and Plant Sciences Division. Uh, and he is at the National Soil Survey Center in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, my name is Richard Reed. I'm a soil scientist with the uh, Central National Technology Support Center in Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, I will display our contact information uh, at the end of this presentation so that questions may be directed to either of us. So let me know when you can see the next slide. You're good. Okay. So uh, just a little bit of background, sort of the bigger picture items, uh, the what, why, where, how. Um, there has been a renewed interest. Uh, I, I don't think there's any denying that in the use of biochar as a uh, soil amendment recently. Um, that sort of follows the, the research that Kristen was showing. Um, so bio, biochar is particularly useful uh, in conservation planning to address resource concerns. Um, such as uh, organic matter depletion. And it has taken a center stage recently in, in planning activities, not just on cropland though, uh, ironically, but also on pasture, forest, uh, and urban land. So uh, biochar, as you know, uh, and we've been exploring in this webinar, is uh, an, an amendment that has been proposed to benefit soil properties and qualities, um, such as AWC, um, pH, soil structure, which, which uh, has a profound impact on um, permeability, uh, bulk density, and nutrient holding capacity, among others. So biochar can be expensive to apply. So there is most certainly a need to identify those soils which have um, a potential to see the benefits that it can provide. Adoption, uh, as Kristen mentioned, may be directly related to the return on investment of applying biochar. And so this idea or concept of, of where do we apply biochar based on an expected yield increase is, uh, that is used in the soil interpretation is sort of based on the research by Doku Haki, where they explored the uh, both the probability and the magnitude of crop yield response when biochar is used to improve um, yield limiting soil properties. We'll just leave it at that. Uh, and so this uh, map was created as a result of their research. And uh, this depicts uh, areas of the country in which we would expect to see yield increases as a result of biochar application. And so it sort of follows with, with what we know about um, productivity of soils across the continental United States. In Iowa, where we have super productive soils, um, you know, maybe we, we don't see quite a high, as high of a yield increase uh, based on the application of biochar, whereas, or conversely, it, where we have poorer soils, uh, we would expect maybe a, a higher yield increase. There we go. So to give a little background on the development of this interpretation, um, it kind of all started with uh, a gentleman named Brandon Smith, who was a uh, former, um, I think a program coordinator for the Soil Health Division, not sure about that title, but he had a wonderful idea to build this screening tool for conservation planners to aid uh, in, in helping to determine where biochar may provide the best results or potentially the, the best return on investment. And so uh, just to give you a little background on the sort of the framework within Soil and Plant Sciences Division, we have this broad interpretations focus team, which is comprised of several sub teams. Um, Bob Dobos teaches a class on the science of interpretations, which is uh, mentored by several of us on the, uh, the larger interpretations focus team. So this class, um, uh, cunningly <laughs> provides both members and function uh, for the science component of the interpretations focus team. This venue allows us to address interpretive needs through a specific channel to accomplish interpretive projects quickly. 
So basically, after literature review and research has taken place, we develop what's called a criteria table, which is then translated into this, this fuzzy logic system of our sort of our internal NASA's client database. Um, and that is done by members of the uh, designing and developing interpretations sub subgroup which is, uh, again, another component of the larger interpretations focus group. So to give you an example of, of what a criteria table looks like when it's done, uh, here's an example of, of the criteria table used for the dynamic soil properties response to biochar interpretation. And if you note that both uh, soil and site properties are included in the criteria table, um, here we attempt to assemble and, and also sort of qualify values from the literature based on their, their impact on soil use. Um, so taking pH, for example, uh, from zero to 30 centimeters, we know that uh, below a pH of five and a half, that the application, generally speaking, of biochar is going to provide some a pretty good results. Uh, the soil is gonna respond to that application fairly well in the form of, of a yield increase. Uh, we're, whereas uh, above a pH of, of seven and a half, we're probably not gonna see as much of a, of a, um, a beneficial uh, response to the application of biochar. So some soil and site properties cannot be changed on a human time scale. Um, by the application of biochar. Uh, these types of properties include things like slope, um, karst topography, flooding ponding, stones in, in the surface horizon, those types of things, it, it's hard for us to change. And so the way I, I look at, at these soil properties and site properties um, is sort of a one-to-one -one relationship to, to the overall interpretation. If the slope is too great on say cropland, for example, you're probably not going to be able to apply it. If, uh, if your site floods on, on, let's say cropland, if your site floods, uh, you, you know, the application of biochar probably is not gonna provide a good response because there's risk of, of it washing away, right? Um, so, so I look at those properties as having sort of a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, conversely, uh, these other soil properties, which we can hopefully change for the better uh, by the use and application of biochar, um, we call these uh, dynamic soil properties. And these, these can be uh, changed by use and management, as you all know. Um, these properties sort of work in concert with each other to impact the level of influence on the overall interpretation. Um, so, in theory, while any one property alone doesn't necessarily make a soil suitable or unsuitable, a collection of those properties may have a stronger influence. So how does the interpretation work? So uh, this is an example of uh, how the fuzzy logic system in, in the NASA's client handles soil property data. So this example shows pH on the x-axis and on the y-axis, we can see uh, the overall response or suitability. So zero means not suitable and one means highly suitable. Below a pH of five and a half, we would expect the largest benefit or the largest response. And above a value of seven and a half, we would expect the least benefit or the least response with some fuzziness uh, to the level of benefit in between those two values. Um, so this is one of about 15 soil and site properties that is used in the soil interpretation. So more importantly than, than all the background and all this discussion is probably how to get to this interpretation. So it's as easy as one, two, three, sort of. Uh, search your browser for web soil survey, uh, not to be confused with soil web, which is a different web platform that is also useful for viewing and disseminating soils information. Um, you're gonna click on the link to web soil survey, click on, click on the, uh, the green uh, start web soil survey icon. Uh, and then the next you navigate to your area of interest, uh, however you choose to do that, whether it's typing in an address, um, entering a Latin long, um, importing uh, 
uh, you know, shapefile, something like that. And then you create your area of interest. And, and there are several ways to create an area of interest. You can use a shapefile. You can use a, uh, a fixed rectangle. You can use a freeform polygon. However you choose, uh, you do it, double click, and then that will take you to the soil map tab, uh, which will delineate out your area of interest and provide a soil map. So after each soil and site property is evaluated, um, here is an example of the uh, interpretive output for the dynamic soil properties response to biochar interpretation, which is available in Web Soil Survey. Um, this shows the expected response of the application of biochar to selected soils. Um, this provides a great planning tool on where on the ground we can expect the best result from the application. Uh, so, as you can see by the arrows, you navigate over to Soil Data Explorer, uh, so Suitabilities and Limitations for Use tab, which is where all of our thematic interpretations are stored. Uh, and then over on the Soil Health Explorer pane, you can uh, navigate down to Dynamic Soil Properties Response to Biochar. And you'll notice there's a few different options here. Uh, view description will take you to the metadata for the interpretation, which includes criteria, a brief description, uh, the literature citation. Um, under advanced options, you'll see different options for aggregation, which I'll talk a little bit more about here in just a second. Uh, and then you can also view ratings. So when you click view rating, uh, you'll get a map with the different uh, rating and the uh, rating reasons for each map unit. So uh, here are two soil map units uh, from a Maryland farm. Um, each map unit has a slightly different overall map unit rating. Uh, we can expect good dynamic soil uh, property response to biochar applications on the GGB map unit uh, and slightly less of a response on the GGC map unit circled in red. So keep in mind for each soil map unit, uh, that is listed here, GGB and GGC, there are one or more components that may be present within those map units. And the rating reasons are listed for each major and minor component. It is important to know which component or components you have present on your area of interest. Although the soil may, map unit may have a good response overall, there may be minor components that have less response and may not provide the return on investment. So with that, I think that is the end of my discussion. Uh, if you have any questions or feedback on the Web Soil Survey interpretation uh, for dynamic soil properties response, uh, please feel free to reach out to either Bob Dobos or myself, and we will do our best to answer your questions. Thank you. Hey, uh, Rich, it looks like Josiah has a question. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks for the offer to reach out directly. I was wondering if you're going to be around for any of the Q&A sessions scheduled for later or if you got to jump out right now. I do have to jump out for a, for a 12 o'clock meeting, but uh, I can call back in as soon as that meeting is over. That is very gracious of you. Thank you so much. And um, uh, is there any way you can provide the, uh, the email information or contact information uh, in, in the, the chat? Yeah, in the chat or something. Sure. Yeah, I sure can. Thank you so much. Oh, actually, I see it right there. You've put it on that last slide. Perfect. Yeah, and, and we'll be sure to include it. Um, we do have a couple of questions inside the Q&A. Um, do you have any time right now, or would it be better if you could come back later? Uh, I think I have a few minutes here, so we could we could probably field a few questions if okay. I if I can answer them. <laughs> if I can, I'll, yeah, I'll get back. Um, with well, it's uh, so the most recent one is if you apply biochar to a soil that has a high pH, will it continue to increase the pH to problem levels? Oh, whoops, I'm, that's not for you. The next one up is for you. Can you use this tool to satisfy the low organic matter eligibility requirements for soil carbon amendment eight hundred eight three three six? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, technically, uh, I would think that a low organic matter requirement would be would be organic matter depletion resource concern. And so, yes, biochar could be used as a tool, along with compost, perhaps to 
to uh, increase the organic matter and, uh, and get you where you need to be. Okay. Yes, I guess on that same pH, uh, sorry to jump in, on that same pH question, um, a lot of the farmers that we're working with are using um, uh, lime, gypsum, and sulfur to be adjusting their pH on a regular basis anyways. Um, so is there any way that we can turn off the pH filter to look at the outcomes? Turn off the pH filter. Um, Meaning well, like the pH would not influence what the prediction, what the predicted outcomes would be? Since, yeah, ironically, the farmers are, I'm sorry, go ahead. Ironically, in the interpretive model right now, pH is sort of handled um, uh, the same as, as a lot of the other soil properties that would influence uh, response to biochar application. Um, it is thought that pH is a pretty, pretty large driver in, in whether a soil is responsive or not. So if they're, if technically, if they're, um, if they're applying a lot of lime and they've got their pH where it needs to be, they may or may not see as much of a response to biochar applications as if, as if the pH was naturally or inherently low. Um, so uh, we could explore that. Uh, yeah, perhaps it's been something we've we've seen quite a bit, particularly on the higher side of pH, because uh, farmers with a higher pH, native pH, are con consistently using uh, amendments to control that within a better range, and so thus the the soil re the web soil survey might show that a resp positive response is unlikely, but yet in experience we see significant positive response, and so since since pH is something that's adjusted. Uh, fairly easily with, you know, lime, gypsum, and sulfur, I was wondering if it would be possible in the future or if it's possible right now to be able to turn that function off while leaving the rest of them active. Um, well, we could, we could certainly diminish its level of influence in the interpretation. But that would have to be done into the coding of the system. That's right. Okay. But that answered it. Perfect. Thanks. Awesome. And then we have a question from Loretta uh, for you, Richard. It says, in the biochar interpretation, could aluminum amount be added as criteria, uh, particularly in tropical and subtropical soils? Um, it could, yes. Although I think, I think that that pH factor uh, where we have it set at five and a half being uh, the absolute most responsive, you know, below pH is a five and a half is where you're really going to start to see aluminum become, you know, uh, more readily available. And so, you know, I would have to give some thought on, on uh, aluminum availability related to pH and see if, if there's added benefit to uh, incorporating aluminum. Uh, then the other, the other thought too is, is, how good or how valid is the aluminum data that we have within our internal database? Um, these are all constraints that we have to sort of um, live off of. And, and if the aluminum data that we have is, is um, minimal or is not as reliable, then pH may be the best uh, soil property that we have to get at that. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah, uh, I think it does. Let's see here. Uh, oh, Carol just uh, published your contact information in the Q&A for everybody that's interested in it. Uh, so there's one comment that maybe I can get your input on and then we can, uh, I know you have another meeting to get to. Uh, it says, while the tool is interesting, I think states and RCS will likely require some degree of site-specific data, e.g. soil tests prior to planning and contracting 336. So, um, you know, I think we're all in agreement with that, that uh, typically the application of biochar is going to be um, multidisciplinary in the number of tools and resources that you're going to look to. Uh, again, um, the U.S. Biochar Initiative is available to uh, provide uh, assistance uh, for with your local NRCS agents, but uh, ultimately it's going to be up to them and and you to, to determine your pathway. So yeah, that was good input. Uh, let's see here. Uh, 
I, I think I kind of just stepped on that for you. So, no, that's that's fine. That's a, that's a great point. So, with any uh, soil interpretive screening tool or uh, or or high level assessment, there is always a site specific um, investigation that would be needed if if you really wanted to take it to the next level, uh, and and to you know to determine what soil components you have present, what uh, with within the soil map units that are mapped. Uh, and and you know, and determine if if the assessment or the screening uh, tool that you use is is correct or if it needs improvement or or whatever. So there's a difference between a high level assessment and a and a site specific application for sure. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I agree. So uh, let's see. I th I, Richard, thank you. I'm hoping you can uh, jump back on here in just a bit after your next meeting and join us for the the Q and A down the line. So, thank you. So Will much. do. Thank All you right. for having me. Thanks, yeah, Richard. Thank you. All right, Kristen, I think it's back to you now. Thanks, Richard, for joining at like the last possible minute. Um, I thought uh, he would make a great addition, um, and he really did set me up for this. There was a question in the chat. Obviously, there's four hours in, in nutrient management, um, the right place, the right time, uh, the right source, and the right rate. Uh, but nutrient management is really seasonal, right? So when is your crop there to take up the nutrients that you're applying? Biochar isn't so much, it is a nutrient source, but it's it's not a very big nutrient source. And so putting it at the right time isn't as important in nutrient management. So um, so right now we're really focused on the three R's of biochar management. So sorry for that um, confusion. Um, so uh, again, we're using these principles for nutrient management to, to inform the, the amendment strategy. Now, Richard just gave us this great presentation on how to find the right place using tools within the web soil um, survey. But I would say, well, that tool is amazing. Again, you can make this decision by looking at soil lab reports and you can kind of qualitatively make this decision just by looking at your ground, right? I mean, most farmers know where on their farm they've got poor water infiltration, where they've got low amounts of carbon, or what areas of their farm are just generally unproductive. So, um, so unlike fertilizer, uh, which always comes with a nice label on it, biochars don't always come with NPK or lime values on the package. So to develop a decision support tool, we need to know the physiochemical properties of different biochars. And while there's no federal regulations for labeling biochars, um, to use the NRCS practice standard, you do need to have it evaluated by a laboratory. Um, the lab analyses that are required um, are generally based off of standards developed by the International Biochar Initiative, which created this biochar um, classification system to describe biochars using those metrics. Our decision support tool is based on this same system. So I just wanna point out a few aspects of it. Um, the system describes biochar's agricultural impacts in four areas, um, a biochar's ability to provide long-term carbon storage, provide plant nutrients, um, neutralize soil acidity, and the particle size of the biochar, which likely influences soil retention and infilt uh, water uh, infiltration and retention. Although I will say the theoretical framework that predicts um, how uh, water responds to biochar are, has not really been worked out yet. Um, but overall, this system provides a basis for comparing biochar so that a user could make informed decisions about selecting the most appropriate biochar for their application. Um, again, these four areas uh, we think can be robustly predicted from easily measured biochar properties. So this classification system from IBI gives a quantitative prediction of the impact biochar would have on soil. For instance, when uh, you look at the fertilizer class uh, for this just general label, the number four shows that it has high concentrations of four nutrients in plant extractable forms, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and magnesium. And the subscripts uh, shown here um, will show that it takes, for example, uh, two tons of P to meet the requirement for corn, um, or two tons of uh, potassium, five tons of sulfur, and three tons of magnesium. What this suggests is that if you know a crop's nutrient requirements, um, then it, it can be any crop. Um, here it's, it's for corn. You could apply the right amount of biochar, uh, perhaps in combination with other nutrient sources to, to meet that crop demand. 
similarly, if you have a target pH, you can calculate the amount of biochar you need to make that adjustment. Um, the classification is the framework of our decision support tool and uses this accounting-based approach to figure out those three R's I talked about. Okay, so let's take a look. Here's the tool. It's available at pmwbiochar.org. Um, so uh, if you uh, want, you can go there. Um, if you just want to follow along, I'm going to go through some main features of the site. Um, when you land on the homepage, there's a bunch of these little flip boxes on here, and we hope that these will help folks gain a basic understanding about biochar by providing educational content, um, case studies, research highlights. You can find a producer or compare different biochars. But what I want to spend a lot of time on today is the toolkit, um, which can be found up here under tools in the main uh, toolbar. So, um, if you want to start this this process by getting some info, you want to start this process by getting some information about your soils, and you can do this in one of two ways. If you're living in the Pacific Northwest, you can type in an address, click on a Google map, and get information about the soil series, the predicted nutrient status, physical properties uh, about your soil, like predicted um, texture and organic matter, and uh, then also predicted moisture properties and predicted chemical properties like PHEC and uh, extractable P. Now, the case study we're looking at today is not in the Pacific Northwest, so we can't pull that information from the map. Um, however, if we click through to the next box on the site, we can manually enter it from a soil test. And lucky for us, our case study, um, in this case, the farmers provided very detailed soil test results from a soil health benchmark study. So we can enter those values to start to identify some of his soil deficiencies. And in some ways, this is even better because the data that the map pulls up from the Sorgo database and all that information is based on, on soil map unit. It doesn't account for past management strategies, nutrient management, or prior amendments. Um, the map's a great place to start if you know nothing about your soil, but if you have a soil test, that's even cooler. So I'm, I'm glad to show an example that's not in the Pacific Northwest. Um, again, this is the first step of our biochar selection tool, which prompts you to identify the needs of your soil. Um, and based on that, you can select management goals. Based on those goals, you can identify a biochar at a rate that makes sense. So here's some information that was given us uh, by the grower, and you can see that he's already got a, a fairly high amount of organic matter. Um, you'll, you could remember back, um, sorry, back here, the, the map that um, that was generated by the web soil survey in these green areas was showing that this farm has low organic matter, but this farmer um, is uh, really interested in, in adding carbon to the soil, and so he puts a lot of compost, he raises cattle, so there's a lot of manure impact, um, so his organic matter is actually at 4.6%. Um, here's some fertility data from his uh, soil test, his pH is uh, 6.5, and, and here's his texture results. So once that information is gathered, either through the map or through soil tests, the system will help you identify deficiencies. It starts by evaluating your organic carbon value. Here you can see that the farmer has sufficient organic carbon values in his soil. Um, and next, the tool is going to tell you about uh, the fertility. But that... Um, Fertility information is really important to do through the lens of the crop that you're planting. Um, to contextualize our recommendations, we uploaded extension requirements uh, for 40 Pacific Northwest crops, um, and here they're listed. You can see that we've got um, common vegetables like asparagus and sweet corn, forage and seed crops um, like alfalfa and clover, and then berry crops like raspberry and blueberry. Um, again, these are all Pacific Northwest crops. Um, I'll talk about how we're going to uh, expand this um, a little bit later. So um, again, understanding that this is not the Pacific Northwest, a lot of these values still translate. So this farmer raises cattle on his ground. So here we pick pasture as the crop of interest. And you can see that according to Pacific Northwest standards, his potassium is on, on the really low side. Um, it also tells me about other nutrients, um, including Potassium, uh, if you scroll down, there's a lot more, but you can see that those are also low. Um, and I just didn't have room on the slide to show you. Okay, so again, um, if you click through, uh, you can see that, that inf uh, we also get information about pH. Uh, and here, this is in a really good range for his crop. Um, if it was too low, the tool would tell me how much uh, liming material to actually add. Um, and then it will also tell me, according to soil texture, about hydraulic or water properties, including plant available water and infiltration. Okay, so um, 
Oh, hang on a second. Okay, so now after getting some information about um, the soil and uh, the crop needs, we can start to choose some goals. And there's a lot of sort of pre-listed goals within this system, um, including sequestering carbon, uh, goals regarding water, nutrients, uh, microbial activity, and uh, reducing salts or, or binding heavy metals. Um, now, based on the information we got from our farmer, I picked three goals. Now, this farmer is really interested in carbon, wants to continually add carbon to the system. So even though his carbon is on the high side, which is 4.6, um, we can still uh, add sequestering carbon as a goal. Um, we want to increase phosphorus and increase water retention on his farm. So after I, uh, we've identified the goal, the tool searches our database and ranks biochar choices depending on the goals. So it tells me which biochars match those three priorities. So for the first priority, which was sequestering carbon, um, it's going to choose a high temperature wood biochar where all that carbon can be locked up in those stable ring structures um, that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. Uh, for the second goal, uh, we're going to increase phosphorus. It's going to choose a really ash heavy biochar like poultry or white oak. For water holding capacity, it suggests a really high temperature biochar. And then um, it's gonna put it all together um, and make a suggestion based on rank. So uh, here you can see which ones were chosen for priority one, two, and three. And then the, the biochars that match the most priorities are gonna be recommended. So here you can see that uh, Oregon white oak um, is probably gonna be the best uh, biochar for your bang in this situation because it might fit at least two of your needs. So um, once I identify a biochar, I can choose from my library to find out how much carbon and nutrients I can obtain from different amendment rates. For example, here, it tells me that for a particular wood biochar at 0.5 tons an acre, you can add 900 pounds of uh, carbon per acre, or 900, 900, that can't be right. Oh, that's pounds per acre, sorry. So you're gonna be adding 914 pounds per acre if you use 0.5 tons, tons per acre biochar. And you, so you can see how that's ranked, sorry about that. Um, so, um, but how do I get those numbers? Um, are they realistic? What if the biochar you're picking isn't in our database? How can you figure out what the added benefits of biochar are at a particular amendment rate? So now I'm gonna go through some uh, tests um, so, so I'm going to diverge from the atlas for a minute to go over a typical lab report that you might get from um, this suite of analysis recommended by the IBI um, and that are also required uh, by the practice standard. And I'm going to review how you might take those results and use them in a meaningful way to inform your amendment strategy. So shown here is sort of this typical lab report, and you can see that there's just a lot of information on there um, listed about physical, chemical properties. Some of these are really important and have a huge impact on soil fertility and carbon. Others are good information because if you're gonna use biochar for uh, the 336 practice, it needs to meet regulatory thresholds for metal. But today we're just gonna focus on agronomically uh, important features. Two important fe features that we're gonna continue um, to come back to um, are moisture content and bulk density. Nearly, uh, all of these parameters are required for bone, or nearly all the, the sort of metrics you're reading on this um, report are done on bone dry biochar. So we need that moisture content to back calculate how much fertility you're adding and to do most of the calculations we're gonna go through. Um, keep in mind that if you deliver the biochar to different moisture content, all the calculations need to be readjusted for that moisture content. So um, moisture content is just that, how much water is in your biochar sample. So um, I think the most important calculation that most of us are interested in is understanding how much carbon you're adding to the soil. Biochar contains three kinds of carbon. And I talked a little bit um, about this at the beginning of the slide. I showed those pie graphs. Um, I think I've got one actually on here. There it is. Um, we've got these pie graphs um, and these are the three kinds of carbon. You've got inorganic carbon in the form of ash. You've got stable carbon in the form of you know, big ring structures. And then you've got volatile carbon, um, which is really available for microbial, um, microbial food. Um, so uh, th these three uh, parameters are measured using a technique called proximate analysis, where we just progressively combust the carbon to determine how much of each fraction we have. And these should add up to 100%. 
Um, this is again the value that I showed. Um, and I'll say that the amount of C, stable C, is important for carbon sequestration. And the amount of ash is particularly important in determining liming value and um, also fertilizer value. Now we'll see the HC ratio of um, the H carbons. And the HC ratio is a ratio of the hydrogen atoms to carbon atoms in the biochar sample. This is a measure of how stable the biochar will be in soil. And that's because if you've got a biochar that doesn't have a lot of hydrogen atoms in it, it's really hard for microbes uh, to attack that and requires a lot of energy. So it's, it's more uh, energetically costly to break this biochar down than if you've got a biochar that has a higher HC ratio, um, so more hydrogen, um, and then those, those carbon bonds um, are more labile. Um, therefore, uh, HC ratio is just a, a measure of biochar stability. Um, now, using uh, these values, it's pretty straightforward to calculate how much carbon you're adding to the soil. Specifically, you need the fraction of organic carbon um, in the biochar, the moisture contents, um, and the application rate. So, um, using the value on this lab analysis and assuming you're amending at 10 tons an acre, we're just going to multiply the organic carbon fraction by the decimal percent water content, um, by the application rate to get in this case, 4.6 tons of organic carbon per acre. And again, this is the organic carbon. This is not including the inorganic carbon that's in the, in the ash contents. So uh, how much of an addition is this to uh, existing soil stocks? Well, it all depends on how deep the biochar is applied and how much of the field is being amended. If you're amending to an acre for a slice, um, and for those uh, who aren't farmers, an acre for a slice is uh, 6.7 inches deep, which is generally you know, how deep farmers used to plow, um, you can assume that the weight of the soil in an acre weighs about a thousand tons. Um, so um, if we add 10 tons of biochar and 4.16 of these tons are carbon, we're increasing soil organic carbon not soil organic matter, <laughs> soil organic carbon by 0.146 or by 0.416%, which is a huge amount of carbon. Um, so, um, so that's how you do that. I, I want to say that Josiah is going to talk about calculators later. So don't um, rush through and write this down because I think uh, these slides will be available and um, Josiah is going to show you some tools where you can don't need to do this manually. Um, Again, um, you know, this value is um, really easy to calculate if you, if you just know those three values, the amount of organic carbon, the water content, and the application rate. So what about soil fertility? Um, how much am I offsetting my fertilizer needs by adding a bunch of biochar? Again, your lab report informs that answer. So uh, the values of NPK shown on the report, um, so in this case, it's down here, um, are reported in dry weight in parts per million or milligrams of biochar uh, per kilogram or milligrams uh, per kilogram soil. And so uh, just PPM or parts per million is the same as milligrams per kilogram. People get confused about that um, a lot. Um, so uh, uh, again, the values that are shown on this uh, particular biochar are really low. And for the most part, if you've got a really small ash fraction, in this case, the ash fraction is 2.4%, you're likely to have low amounts of P and K in your biochar. Almost all biochars have low amounts of nitrogen. So, um, so I wouldn't expect to see high nitrogen values. Um, these values are 10 for nitrogen, uh, 38, uh, 3985 uh, for potassium, and 460 uh, for phosphorus. Um, so how do we get there? So um, a biochar that has 50% moisture content has half of this fertility value, right? So farmers don't tend to think in PPM or milligrams per kilogram. So we need to con convert all these amounts to pound per acre. To do this, I'm just gonna multiply by a conversion factor. That's 0 0.002. Um, if you're wondering where that number came from, I'm happy to go through the conversion, but um, it's, not that important, but it's 0 0.002. And that changes our units from milligrams to kilogram to pounds per ton. And then I just multiply the weight, um, the, the weight values by the application rate to come up with how many pounds per acre we're adding. Um, so you can see um, that in this case, uh, and, and then of course I have to account for the wet weight of biochar. Um, 
So uh, what you can see is that in this case, if I make all those conversions, then we've got uh, the nitrogen value is 0.1 pound per acre if I'm putting on 10 tons. If um, uh, the for potassium, it's 39 pounds per acre, which is a lot of potassium um, for sure. And for phosphorus, it's 4.57 pounds um, an acre. But in general, biochars are going to have pretty low um, fertilizer value. Um, and, and just to put this in perspective, the most value here is in the K, which is about one third the amount needed to fertilize an acre of corn. Okay. So what about lime? Does um, adding this biochar help offset lime? If we look at the analysis, it'll show two values, the pH and the calcium carbonate equivalents. pH is really important, but it doesn't determine the amount of liming power that a biochar can offer. So let's look at the calcium carbonate equivalents, um, which is exactly that. The equivalent to lime is essentially what calcium carbonate equivalents is. Um, here it says that it's 2.5%, meaning that it's 40 times less potent than lime. Um, but it's still something to consider, especially if your calcium carbonate equivalence numbers are higher. I've seen um, calcium equivalence numbers up to 30% in really high ash biochars. So to calculate how much neutralizing power we're adding, we're going to take the decimal percent carbon cal uh, calcium carbonate equivalence, and we're going to multiply that by the amendment rate, and then multiply that by uh, the moisture content. And this comes to 0.12 tons of calcium carbonate uh, uh, per acre, which isn't a lot. But again, if you're applying a biochar with a higher ash content, it could really offset a lime budget. Okay, again, there's lots of data contained in this report. Um, many we will not use to determine how the biochar reacts in soil. But again, values like metals are really important to quantify and understand so that we don't contribute uh, to heavy metal pollution in agricultural systems. Okay, so how much um, biochar is in a ton? And, and this is a really important question. Um, we can use the bulk density uh, measurement to figure it out. Here, the labs report that the bulk density is 11.3 pounds per uh, cubic foot. Um, to change uh, those values to yards, I need to multiply the value by 27. And if I do that, I get that it's um, 301 pounds per yard, right? Um, from there, we can switch this to tons by dividing by 2,000. Um, and when we do that, we get that there's 6.6 .6 yards per ton. To get wet weight values, I need to divide the number of uh, the dry pounds um, by the uh, moisture content um, uh, fraction um, to get that there's 613 pounds per yard in a wet biochar. Um, and this, again, if you uh, switch that over to tons, you can get that it's 3.3 yards per ton. So um, all this information is useful and interesting, but unless a grower can make the economics of biochar work, it's not gonna be applied. So to help farmers make the decision about whether or not it's economical, we developed uh, some economic tools as well. So I'm gonna hop back to the Atlas. So um, to determine um, if this makes economic sense, we've developed this cost benefit analysis tool. And we can use this uh, to determine if adding biochar to improve the growth of whatever crop we're growing makes sense. And here I'm just gonna use potatoes as an example. Um, and within the tool, we can enter in numbers. Uh, here we assumed that there were 500 pounds of bio, uh, that the biochar uh, was $500 a ton. The potato price is $9 per hundred weight and a yield of uh, 600 uh, hundred weight per acre. And then we were gonna get a 5% increase in yield. Um, and you can see that with these assumptions, um, again, here's the crop values that we put in. Um, and we also have a functionality where you can uh, offset the cost of your, um, of your uh, fertilizer as well. So here we're saying that we're gonna lower our nitrogen costs, we're gonna lower our phosphorus costs and our potassium costs and our liming costs. And if we do all that, it'll spit out that the farmer was able to make profit over five years, assuming that there's no change. Um, so in this scenario, biochar makes sense in a potato crop, but what about other crops? So here's just you know quick analysis. Um, and you can see that uh, the biochar cost of either uh, $1,000 or $500 an acre. So this would be um, $500 an acre would be this gray line here. $1,000 per hectare would be this, this 
uh, black line here. And you can see that over, um, uh, over if biochar costs $1,000 per hectare, then the only crop that we evaluated out of all of these um, that would make money is potatoes. Um, however, if we can lower that cost to under $500 a hectare, then other crops start to make sense, um, including things like alfalfa. And um, you can see that wheat is really hard to make money on. However, um, this does not take into account the carbon practice standards that are being um, implemented by the NRCS. So we just spent a whole day listening to NRCS folks talk about this practice standard, but by subsidizing this cost, we may be able to make a substantial difference in the economic paradigm um, that really limits um, a farmer's ability to make money using biochar, especially in commodity crops. Okay, so, um, so thankful to the NRCS. So the NRCS uh, last year uh, initiated an agreement with the Agricultural Research Service to expand this tool across the United States. Um, I've mentioned several times that this tool is really uh, sort of um, focused on Pacific Northwest agriculture, our crops, our soils, our biochars. Um, but now we have the ability, thanks to the NRCS, to expand that to the entire United States, including Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Um, uh, we're going to um, not only add a lot of um, geographical uh, information into this tool, but we're also going to expand um, the functional tool as well. But we couldn't do that uh, without our partners. Um, so um, uh, again, thanks to that agreement, we have this whole slate of partners that's going to help us with this effort. We're going to significantly expand uh, the biochar library. Um, this is going to be done with uh, 10 USDA ARS labs across the country. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to put hundreds of commercially and uh, regionally relevant biochars into the decision support tool so that folks can choose something that makes sense for this farm. Um, if you're a biochar producer and you're interested in having your biochar uh, listed, please contact me and, and we'll test it here, um, provide you those results, and then uh, put the biochar on the atlas. We're also going to be developing a life cycle analysis model that predicts greenhouse gas emission consequences of making and applying biochar, and that includes carbon sequestration. We're hoping to use this model to develop um, a biochar module that can be implemented in Comet Farm, which is a planning tool that's used by technical service providers and conservation planners. Um, that work is gonna be done in uh, collaboration with ORISE, uh, which is a federal agency, and Jim Aminat at WSU. Uh, we're gonna be working with Adam Lindsley at Oregon State University to implement the model uh, and develop the webpage. Um, the USBI is gonna be working with biochar producers to help us gather biochar samples, create fact sheets, conduct webinars, and get feedback on the tool. And then American Farmland Trust uh, is gonna be leading outreach efforts, including developing fact sheets, guidance to farmers uh, through trainings, um, but they're also gonna provide in-reach back to the NRCS to provide workshops and trainings to conservation planners uh, and other technical support providers. So as part of this effort, I really encourage you to go to the webpage. Again, that's pnwbiochar.org. Uh, um, and play around with it. See what works, see what doesn't, uh, and please email me. You can you see my uh, email up here. Um, it's a typical government email, which is just first.lastname at usda.gov. Um, we really want to make an effort to make this functional for everyone and make it useful, and getting feedback on the front end is, is really going to help inform that. Um, so thank you so much for your time, and uh, I'll be around uh, to answer questions. Uh, thank you. Hey, so we do have a number of questions for you in the Q&A. <clears throat> we have one. It says, uh, Kristen, in your case study, the SOM was 4.6%. As you said, the SOM was already very high. Why apply more biochar in this field and not target a different field with lower SOM? Additionally, in your opinion, should we expect USDA to assist with funding biochar applications to a field with an SOM of 4.6%? Yeah, no, it's a great point. And like I said, you know, this is um, one part of the farmer's field. Um, and uh, and I am not aware of all how all the conservation practices um, are sort of uh, ranked. But uh, I think Alana said yesterday that 
carbon dioxide removal was absolutely con conservation practice. And so in this case, it would help the farmer to apply it um, if there was a compelling reason. But yeah, I agree. 4.6% is, is huge, especially in that area where the average SOC is like 0.5%. So um, he's already done a great job of applying carbon to this farm. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. Then uh, the next question is, could this tool be used for compost? <clears throat> compost, or is there a similar tool for compost? Wouldn't that be cool? Um, I'd love to include compost in this, and I've been trying to think of ways to do it. Compost is so variable. I think it's going to be hard. You know, once a biochar is produced, um, it, it changes a little bit, right, as it ages. It actually changes a lot in soil as it ages, but as it's sitting on the lot for three months, it's not going to change a whole lot. Whereas compost, if it's not pulled, um, it, it could change substantially. So I've, I've, if you've got ideas about how to do that, please contact me because I'd, I'd love to create one of these for compost. I think it would be super useful. Yeah, uh, agreed. That would be great. And that, that we answered that live. Uh, uh, Brewer Logan has comment uh, and question. Uh, research has shown an increase in protein and other macros of crops after biochar and compost addition. Uh, does the cost of saving or increased revenue per acre cons uh, consider an increase in crop quality? I think that you could you could fit that into the current economic analysis. Um, what we might do is we could, and, and I think that's a good idea. Is um, you know how much maybe it's not yield that's increasing, but maybe it's value that's increasing. And so what you could do within the tool, I'm not sharing my screen anymore, but I'm going to go back and look at it. Um, what you could do within the tool, uh, maybe once I get back here, I can share it. It's going to take me a second. Um, yeah, so let me share this real quick. I'm just going to share my screen. I'm not going to put uh, presented. But if you can see here is that we've got this crop value um, tab. And so you could change the on-farm price to re like reflect that you're um, doing that. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, here's, uh, thank you for that. And here's a question from, well, first I'm going to go, somebody said uh, the weight per acre was described as 1,000 tons. Can you clarify what was the depth? Because uh, it participant missed that. Oh, 6.7 inches. So an acre furrow slice is what, 2 million pounds? Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so a question about anybody that when somebody submits biochar to the library, um, when they submit it and it tested, could those results then be used to apply to other government programs? Would those tests carry any weight in that regard? It's a really good I mean, question. That's a great question, yeah. Yeah, we are not a certified lab. Um, so it depends on what the, the particular program requires. If they require testing done by a certified NAPT lab, we are not going to meet that criteria. Okay. Uh, I'm just typing it as well. Uh, there we go. Uh, do, so do some uh, biochars contain high enough levels of PAHs or heavy metals that would warrant limits to application rates? Do standard biochar tests measure those levels? And does the NRCS standard require that this composition is determined? For metals, for sure, um, there is. I think the PAH standards are really generous um, for biochars. Most of the biochar tests I've seen do not quantify what's in the volatile fraction um, of the char. It just says that there's a volatile fraction. There's another test that you can get done that costs a lot more money to show you what's exactly in that volatile fraction. Um, but I'm I'm not I'm not sure which labs are providing that information. In our testing, we're not going to look at volatiles. We'll do metals, but we're we're not going to look at volatiles. There are definitely standards for metals, um, and it should again, it's all going to be in context of like what if you're if you're like I work with a farmer in Idaho, right? Um, who's right along uh, the Coeur d'Alene River. He has crazy amounts of metals in his soils. Um, there's no amount of biochar that we're going to add that's going to contribute to that. <laughs> in fact, it would probably dilute the, the current metals that he has in his system. Yeah, good input. Uh, so uh, Muriel is asking if different types of biochar can be combined uh, when the best kind isn't just one kind. Oh, good question. We haven't thought about blends. That's a great idea. Like, uh, we could say yeah. kind of this bio I love that. That's a great idea. Yeah. It's Thanks been coming up a lot lately in discussions that we've had with folks. Um, yeah. They're saying, well, because 
you know, in Utah, we have a lot of um, pine, so the conifers are like, it's really excellent for the water holding capacity, but may not be the best carrier for some other uh, strategy that they have. Yeah, the other functionality that we don't have, and maybe what we could do is create a calculator where you could put in like your own analyses and have it spit something out. And that way you could say, well, how much, you know, if I have a compost and a biochar, I could put in some analyses with um, the compost analysis and then with the biochar analysis and then pick a blend, right? Um, I think we could do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it seems like it's the future. I mean, we do that with our our other inoculants, right? So it's all about balance and measure. Um, and and that also brings up the good point. You know, uh, we were talking about this yesterday about biochar being a magic bullet. There is, a, we need to reiterate, there is no such thing as the perfect biochar. There's only the perfect biochar for the application. So that means you need to realize your soil structure, what your goals and objectives are what your nutrient plan is and act accordingly. So just because it says biochar doesn't mean it's the right biochar for your uh, use case. Um, so, but uh, please do uh, stick with us. <laughs> uh, somebody did have a question about uh, what if your feedstock's a, a mixed feedstock? I guess that, because that gets us into a blend no matter what. If you have a mixed feedstock and you want to send us your biochar, we're happy to characterize it. Um, I, it's not going to, you know, as long as you have the, the characterization test, test, it doesn't really matter what it's made from because, um, because we can, we can put that information on the atlas and somebody can, can choose, oh, my biochar is 50% manure and 50% um, wood, right? Um, mm -hmm. Or if you're a commercial biochar producer, and you want to say that, you know, uh, uh, we're rogue biochar and, and this is our, you know, what you can expect from a typical batch, um, then, then you can look that up and, and figure it out. So, right. And, and a lot of commercial, I think one thing to point out is that a lot of commercial uh, biochar producers typically deal with uh, single types of feedstocks. Like, for example, I, I, I deal with just con a conifer blend. Uh, because it's a sawmill that I get my material from, they're, you know, that's what they're dealing with exclusively. They're not touching hardwoods. So, um, and, and so in bioenergy, you might find that it's a specific uh, type of tree. So yeah. um, uh, the, there's a question about the atlas. Uh, does it help uh, those that are choosing biochar for water filtration versus only for ag? That'd be interesting to expand uh, the market for biochar. I know this market's trying to figure out how to use biochar as well. So we've talked a lot, a lot about that. Um, I would love to add functionality for, um, for uh, binding toxins and um, nutrients. I think that would be super cool to do. Um, I've been in touch with folks at OSU who uh, have sort of that expertise and, and uh, can help me build the theoretical framework we would need uh, to present that. Um, now all we need is the funding, so. <laughs> <laughs> we, always need, hey, we always need funding if anybody wants to sponsor a project. Uh, reach yeah. out to Kristen or contact us at USBI. We can help um, you out. I know that's that's one of the ongoing issues with this industry. I mean, we're talking about agriculture today, but I mean, it's used in construction materials, insulation, plastic integration. Uh, like it's it's carbon. It's a simple material, but it has elegant solutions, right? Yeah, and I think that any of these any of these sorts of application and uses, whether it's in potting media or drywall or um, used to, to bind a toxin. I think all of those have the same relationship where you can describe the properties of the biochar, describe what properties you need and make a match. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, I don't think any of that, I think that's all a great idea. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to do the work if, uh, if we can find some funding, but we're looking <laughs> for funding is what I'll say is that we're actively, you know, talking to our national program officers or actively, um, uh, working with other agencies uh, like the EPA um, on on whether or not we can find funds to do this. So, yeah. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to ask you about four or five more questions before we go on to Josiah. Um, there are two questions that I'm going to combine kind of into one. Um, one is about could you could you extrapolate on the HC ratio? Is a high ratio a good thing? And then the follow-up to that is uh, addressing sizing um, and how size of the biochar influences performance in soil. Yeah, so both really good questions. So the HC ratio, um, 
is I think the I think the the HC ratio is good. Um, the OC ratio is you know especially if you're trying to find things um, and create microbial communities um, from biochar. It is good to have you know more functionality uh, within your biochar molecules. Um, we can add pure graphite, which is what you know a, a biochar with a really low to C rate, high H to C ratio would look like. Um, but uh, and that's great for stability. But again, it, it depends on what your choices are. So I think adding something that has both uh, permanence um, and something uh, that adds uh, food for microbes is, is important. Um, so I think a balance is good. Um, other people, again, it depends on your goals. If, if you're trying to provide carbon credits, you're going to want something with a really low HC ratio because that's mm -hmm. going to have more of a permanence than the higher carbon. Does that, I hope that answers your question. If not, uh, feel free to ask. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty good. I think some of the folks might have questions about the durability when it's in soil based on the, the HC ratio and the OC ratio. I know it took me quite a long time to figure it out myself. So, uh, and, 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 and so yeah, so it's a good one. Um, oh, and, and then the other one was- um, The sizing, yeah. I, yeah, so sizing isn't like a, I mean, when you get biochar out of your production system, obviously it it looks a lot like what you put in, right? So if you put in big chunks, you're gonna get out big chunks. If you put in small chunks, you're gonna get out smaller chunks. Um, but, you know, all of that is 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 sizable. Our, we don't have the theoretical frame. What, what size is really important for is surface area and size is also really important for water holding capacity. So things like sorption, um, and things like how much water can it hold. There's no good theoretical framework right now that says if you add um, this size particle into this texture of soil, this is going to be how much more water you have. Um, I wish we had that theoretical framework. We don't. What I will say is that if you want to increase your water holding capacity and you're in a sandy soil, add silt size particles. Um, but I can't I don't have that recommendation yet. So unfortunately the particle size um, functionality within our tool is not very useful. And in fact, if you um, if you add that in as one of your goals, it's gonna say, add a really small size biochar. Um, don't add big coarse granules because that's gonna make it go quicker. Yeah, so um, I have noticed a number of studies that have shown one to three millimeters in size is typically kind of the, the optimal for water holding capacity and nutrient distribution, but again, always with the caveat of it depends really on yeah. what your application and it really is. depends on what soil type you have so <laughs> I know like if you have a clay you don't want to you know a really if you have a silty one yeah it's just it, it's it's dependent and um and it's something we can talk about um when we're building this tool i just don't know that we're going to come up with something that's uh yeah super, and we can we can talk about it a little bit more i think in josiah's session as well yeah. so john reese is asking Depending on the IBI analysis of the biochar, could compost inoculant choice be used to create a balanced solution of sequestration and fertilizer? Um, can you read that again? Kind of, oh, so it was. It's basically saying if you if you add compost to it, um, it doesn't provide a balance. Yeah. Uh, but, so that way it works for your sequestration and possibly your carbon credits as well as the fertilizer. Oh, I am a huge fan of applying biochar. Uh, compost mixtures. I think it's a, a it's, synergy. So yeah. yeah, Bill Session will cover on that a little bit later on. And, and, and that kind of tends to be the overall goal for soil health is a combination of the stable carbon plus the biology that's afforded from your uh, compost. Uh, let's see. Uh, I, there was one more question I wanted to catch. Uh, oh, yeah. Folks are asking, when's the timeline when you'll be able to accept the samples? Um, February. So we're, we just hired a technician that's going to coordinate all of this and uh, start accepting samples. So if you uh, have something, uh, pop me an email at kristen.trip at usda.gov and, and we'll get it in here and uh, we'll get it going. So. And, and then on that inoculation front, uh, any data or resources covering different types of inoculation being used with biochar pr prior to implementation? Um, I don't entirely understand if that means post post creation of the biochar, or maybe they're trying to reference um, addendums added to the feedstock before it's made, so we can get maybe more phosphorus uptake. And yeah. Like that. So, I again, I think it, it's going to depend on what you're adding and when you're adding it in the process. 
Um, but again, if you've got a biochar that's all ready to go post-process, send it to us and we'll evaluate it. Um, and it shouldn't matter if you added like a bunch of rock dust in the beginning of the of the processing, that should show up in the lab report. So so please send it away. Um, and again, thank you guys for all your time. I, I super appreciate your input. Yeah, Kristen, thanks for letting me put you on the spot with all those questions. It was a fantastic presentation. So thank you so much. Uh, look forward to you connecting with us later on in the presentation for the, the Q and A's. And with that, we wrap up a fantastic day two session one with Kristen Tripwild. That conversation was just amazing. Thank you, Kristen, and also want to give a thank you to Richard Reed, USDA Soil Science, for his web soil survey. Also, a fantastic presentation, powerhouse back to back like that. We couldn't do this without our sponsors. Thank you to the U.S. Forest Service, the U.S. Composting Council, American Farmland Trust, Grain Ecosystems, VAO ASA, Wakefield Biochar, and Go Biochar. Day two, session two is on its way. We're going to be speaking with Pacific Biochar and Josiah Hunt and his co-worker and soil installer, Charlie. They're going to have some fantastic information, and Josiah will be revealing the new USBI soil carbon calculation tool for biochar application again day two usda and rcs code 336 and 808 soil carbon amendment program thank you for joining be sure to like and subscribe